Hello everyone and thank you for joining us this morning at Disciples Church Online. A happy Easter to you. Our pastor Vlad is going to be taking us through the resurrection of Jesus Christ today in his sermon. After his sermon I'm going to be coming back for a few announcements about what we're going to have in the weeks ahead for activities wise such as prayer groups and bible studies um, and also after the service we do have a special communion as well together as a church if you're a member of the church all you have to do is follow the third link that's number three on your whatsapp or your email which you will be sent the third link will then take you through to our communion page in which we can all share in that together i hope you enjoy the sermon and god bless worship God together, enjoying his creation outside today, as we think of his resurrection and what that's meant for our lives.
us out of the grave, Lord. Well, good morning to this Sunday morning Easter service. Thank you for joining us today. It is a pleasure to be here with you today. Today we will be studying the case for the resurrection of Christ. And I know this is a very debatable topic, but my intention will be to share with you what the scripture says and in a way try to understand, uh, regardless of the philosophy and the religions of this world and everything that is uh, said about Christ and against his resurrection anything the skeptics may say uh, we want to challenge based on what the scripture uh, is teaching us uh, if you are new with us and you want to uh, go and check any other of our previous teachings please visit our page our web page on www.discipleschurch.co.uk where you can find a lot more material it is all free and you can freely distribute it for your friends and family um, if you are a Christian and today you listen to this uh, Sunday Easter Sunday sermon I just want to encourage you I just want you to see how wonderful the resurrection of Christ is for all of us what it means and what it implies to our lives today it is indeed an incredible thing that uh, a man could come back to life but if that man is the Son of God, God Himself taking the form of man and being in the form of a man, giving His life to pay for our sins and then to come back alive, that 
has huge implications for our, our everyday life. If you are not a Christian, if you are not a believer, I would just like to encourage you. Um, if you live this life in a way thinking that all that you can see is all that this life is about, and you think, what's the point of life? What, why are we here? Uh, what's, what's the whole reason for my existence? I really hope that today's message will be a great blessing to you. I just want you to see how much God loves you and to what extent did Jesus go in order to give you and I an opportunity to know Him, to experience Him, to receive His blessings, to come to know what this life is really all about. Because if there is indeed resurrection after the dead, then there is a hope for another life. This is just passing by. This is a place where we learn. But then there is another life, according to the scriptures, that is eternal. So before we jump into our study, why don't we just take a minute and pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity you give me today to share these words with my brothers and sisters and with whoever my video reach, Lord whoever might be listening to this right now. And Lord, I thank you for you are indeed revealing yourself all the time to us. You're good to us. You're a blessing to our lives. You give us hope. You give us a way forward. You show us how to live this life. And you indeed reveal that it's not just about this life, but the one to come. Father, I pray that you would help me today. I pray that you would encourage me and give me words of wisdom, words of knowledge, and that your word will be powerful. That you will speak into our hearts, that your Holy Spirit will lead us to yourself. I pray, Lord, that we'll be able to hear the voice of your Spirit calling us to a closer relationship with you, and for those who do not know you, to a true understanding of who you are and what you've done to save us. In Jesus' name, Amen. If you like to open your Bible, please, with me in the book of 1 Corinthians, the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 15. And we're going to be reading from verse 1 to verse 22. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 22. If you don't have a hard copy of the Bible and you want to just use your phone or your tablet or your laptop uh, to access a digital copy of the Bible so you can just follow up in your reading with us that will be good too if you're new to the bible first corinthians will be in the new testament after the epistles after the letter to the to the romans follows the letter to the corinthians and it says now i would remind you brothers of the gospel i preach to you which you receive in which you stand and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, as of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so we believe. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection from the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. 
we are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testify about God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise if, if it is true that the dead are not raised for if the dead are not raised not even Christ has been raised and if Christ has not been raised your faith is futile and you are still in your sins then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished if in Christ we have hope in this life only we are of all people most to be pitied but in fact Christ has been raised from the dead the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep for as by a man came dead by a man has also come the resurrection of the dead for as in Adam all die so also in Christ shall all be made alive so this letter was written by the Apostle Paul he himself is saying here that he was the last of the Apostles he considered himself to be one untimely born as if God would have chosen him at the very very end of Jesus ministry to give him an apostleship to go and proclaim the gospel to the Gentiles and he's here saying to this group of people the Corinthians who were obviously a group of Gentile believers and he's saying to them that the gospel that he proclaimed to them it was the very gospel that he heard and those who received it were the very apostles themselves the ones that spent nearly three years with Christ and it says that the, the message of the, of the gospel was spread through them as well as through him Paul and then he asked them the question why is it that they signed to ask whether or not there was resurrection from the dead and then he brings them into this question of the question and he says if there is no resurrection of the dead then practically what we believe is in vain what is the point of the gospel what is the point of the Bible where is the point of Christ coming to this uh, world to give his life if there is no resurrection of the dead it's all pointless he says but indeed Christ has raised from the dead and because he has raised from the dead now we have hope now we have an opportunity for salvation now it says through one man came sin he's referring to Adam but then he's saying through the one man Jesus came life I believe it was uh, Seneca the one that said this is a time for truth to be discovered for truth cannot be postponed and like I said to you right from the beginning, this issue of the resurrection of Christ has been a question that has been very severely criticized, judged, and people of all kinds, of all different ages, have fought against the idea of the Christ resurrected. This is a, a topic that has been really strongly debated and opposed by many skeptics and atheists. But then one needs to ask, himself whether or not this is true because if it is true then we need to be challenged in the way we perceive life and the opportunity to come back to life or else if this is false then we may as well just close the Bible and throw it away or like many skeptics and you remember maybe if you um, a few years ago if you remember there were some buses in London that had these uh, sign that said stop worrying there is probably no God just kind of live your life and this is the kind of approach that uh, many people uh, you know have about life they just feel like we are in, in a way a, a bunch of materials and a, and a blob of flesh that we're only here for a season and then after this it's just we just become dust and, and, and that is it that is the end of our existence and people like Richard Dawkins for example think this way and it's sad to believe that uh, many people don't even uh, challenge their own views about the resurrection so the questions then that we have to ask is whether or not this is indeed true or is it false now let me just give you a quick definition of the words true and false 
Now you might think, okay, well, I know what truth is and I know what false is. But let me just give you a little definition so that your understanding of truth and false can sort of broaden a little bit so you can see um, in, in, in a little bit of, of a clearer way because you see, we might think that we know the truth, but do we? We might be deceived and we don't even know it. So that's why it's so important to leave this right from the outset very, very clear whether or not the resurrection of Christ was a true fact or is a false fact. If it really happened or it didn't. Because you see, Christianity hangs on the foundation that Christ gave his life to die for our sins. But that's not all. It says that he came back to life. If, if he died and he paid for our sins, but he remained dead in a cave, then our faith is in vain. Then he died with our sins. We're still carrying our sins. But if he indeed came back to life, then that means that he paid for our sins and we have re redemption and now we have a clean slate and now we have an opportunity for an everlasting life. But let's go back to... Uh, our study. Now if you if you want to continue this study with us we're going to go more in depth in the following four weeks. We're going to have a study a week where we're going to be challenging this idea of the resurrection of Christ from a philosophical, a historical, a rational, a theological and an experiential point of view. So if you're interested in this uh, we'll let you know more at the end. But for now, I would just um, like to spend a little time kind of seeing the general idea of the resurrection. But first, like I said, let's go and see what is truth. So, you would agree with me that humanity throughout history has been trying to find the reason for us being here. Why are we here? What's the purpose of humanity? What's the purpose of my life? What is the whole reason of existence? Is, is, is this all there is? And we have tried to find a way to, to come to a point of reference from where we can then move forward. And that point of reference is precisely truth. Because if we are in agreement of what is truth, then we can start working together, trying to figure out, trying to understand the reason for our existence. The word truth is defined in the Cambridge Dictionary as the quality of being true. The real fact about a situation, an event, or a person. The Collins Dictionary defines it as truth is something that is believed to be true. The Merriam-Webster says is the body of real events or facts. And if you check online, for example, Wikipedia will tell you that truth is most often used to mean being in accord with a fact or reality or fidelity to an original or a standard. Truth is usually held to be opposite of falsehood which correspondingly can also suggest a logical, factual and ethical meaning. In philosophy, for example, you will um, see that the basic idea of truth is in the correspondence theory is what we believe or what we say is true if it corresponds with the things the way they actually are. What do I mean by that? When I look at a book like this, my Bible, and I see its color, its shape, uh, the, the texture, and if I describe it and I say to you it's kind of square, it's not too big, it's, it's thick, uh, it has many pages, it has, uh, it's got a brown cover that looks like leather and it's got these golden letters written uh, on it. It has these two uh, tassels in the inside. If I just start describing something like my Bible and you see something completely different, say for example you see something that is round and is very thin and it's, a, it's blue, then we're not talking about the same thing, are we? In order for us to have a point of reference, the very thing that I claim needs to be truth with the thing that you are seeing, so that we both in agreement that the description of anything, whatever it is, 
it is true, not just for me, but for you too, and for everybody for that matter. Otherwise, there is where the idea of relativism comes from, because people think, okay, well, at the end, it's all relative, and we'll talk about this in a minute. But before we get into that, let's talk about the definition of false. According to the Cambridge Dictionary, it is something that is not real. According to the Merriam-Webster, it's something that is not genuine, not true, or not accurate. According to the Collins Dictionary, it's something false, incorrect, untrue, or mistaken. In other words, false is something that is wrong, something that is distorted, inaccurate, something that is unreal, something fraudulent, deceptive, and misleading. And nobody likes to be considered to be a false person. Do you? I don't. When people talk to us and, and, and try to have a relationship with us, we want to believe that that person is truthful in the way they speak, in the things they say. Nobody likes to be told something that is misleading. Nobody likes to buy something with the wrong description and then being given something that is blatantly false, do we? So, hence the importance of knowing the difference between what is true and what is false. Because the issue that we have at stake here is very, a very strong one, a very fundamental one, is the idea of the resurrection of Christ. Did he really resurrect or not? Is it true that somebody can come back from the dead? Is it possible? Did it happen or not? Is it true or are we believing a lie? That is the question. Now, in our understanding, any kind of event that we might perceive in life we have a tendency to approach life from different perspectives and those perspectives are obviously based on our background our philosophy our ideology and everything that we do in life what we learn from our parents tutors teachers uh, in our upbringing the way we think the books that we read the programs that we watch the films the music everything that is surrounding us give us a perspective about life and obviously when we think about uh, the evidence that is presented to us, just like now, for example, with this whole idea of the coronavirus, each one of us will have a different perspective based on our understanding of health, nutrition, or virus or bacteria, whether or not we have somebody at home who is probably a doctor or a nurse or, 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 or uh, somebody that knows about these things, right? So. Today, we live in the age of, of technology and information. So, when you read so many things, so many tweets, so many messages, so many uh, WhatsApp, so many uh, Facebook uh, posts, etc., we, we tend to sort of put a big question mark in everything nowadays and we think, okay, let me decide whether or not I believe this. And that is good. It's good that we exercise that kind of understanding. And when it comes to matter of faith, when it comes to things like what the Bible says, there's no difference. There shouldn't be any difference. We should be able to test what the Bible is saying and prove whether or not it is right, whether or not it is true. Otherwise, like I was saying to you earlier, if what we say that we believe, and we Christians say that we believe, and we have believed for thousands of years, if it's all false, if Christ did not resurrect, then what's the whole point on our faith? Paul himself says this. He says, then if Christ did not raise from the dead, we are, of all people, most to be pitied. Why? Because we would be believing a lie. Because it will be like believing in a fairy tale. And I'm here to tell you that it's not so. If it did happen, then we're talking about eternal things here. We're talking about a life after death. We're talking about that this physical body that we have, one day will not be any longer in this physicality, but will be a spiritual body, like the scripture describes. A body that, although it has essence, and although our mind and our heart and our understanding, our soul is still alive, this flesh will no longer be required. 
will be a, a, a body, if you like, that is then able to be forever, a presence, an entity that is able to remain forever. And according to the scriptures, there's only two ways, either living eternally with God or perishing eternally without God. In, uh, if it did happen, then like I said to you earlier, um, then the idea would be, okay, but Vlad, maybe it is true for you, but probably it's not for me. You choose to believe that, I choose not to believe it. Uh, I have my questions, and like we already said, it's fine to have questions. It's fine to challenge uh, these perceptions of faith and anything else in life. But then you will say, it's all relative. It's all relative. At the end of the day, I don't really care whether or not it happened. It doesn't affect my life in any way. So, you know, why should I care? And, well, if you are then uh, somebody with, with that sort of mentality, if you're either an atheist or if you're probably an, an agnostic or probably somebody who, who somehow is, is, is skeptic, then I would, I would say, okay, uh, what is, what is to, to be an skeptic? Isn't skepticism, uh, in a way, somebody that is always looking for answers? Isn't an skeptic somebody that is an inquirer, someone that wants to know truth? And, and well, you will say, yes, of course. Okay, so if I am to present you truths about the resurrection of Christ, isn't that what you're looking for? If you're on a skeptic, you will say, well, prove to me that the resurrection happened and I will believe in it. But the problem is that many skeptics will never have enough evidence because not even what they believe is something that they can believe in. Isn't that interesting? If a skeptic is an inquirer, somebody that is always in look for truth, that means that even what they think they believe is to be questioned too. But you see, the whole point of truth, and I hope you can agree with me in this, the whole point of a search for truth is one of agreement, so that we can be in the same page, so that we can talk about the same thing, so that when we say this is the way it is, you would agree, so that when we say it's beautiful to be out here in nature, and everybody enjoys the sun shining, and the, you know, the green leaves of, of the trees, and the, the singing of the birds, because we are in agreement that this is something beautiful, this is something good. So this agreement, the joy of life, comes through an understanding, the peace of mind comes through an understanding of what is truth. You see, because according to the scriptures in John 8, 22, it says that you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. So with this in mind, let us then understand that my desire is not to give you my preconceived ideas, but rather for us together to sort of read the scriptures and understand that the Bible gives us facts. The Bible gives us historical, documented facts of things that happen. Literacy will teach us that when you read a text like the Bible, that is one of the, if not the most published book ever, the most uh, read book in the history of humanity, the most believed book, and it has all kinds of interesting historical, scientific, trustworthy facts. When you read about a, a king in the ancient Egypt, for example, or in Babylon, or, or anything like that, the times that the Bible describes, if you go and search in history, in, in the history of that particular nation, you will see that these things indeed happen. Because the Bible is not just a book of faith. It's a book that describes the way God created everything and how He wanted things to work. So when the Bible tells us that Jesus came to this world, I would like to invite you to go and search, for example, in historians of the first century. For example, the Jewish historian Josephus. And, and read his writings and see what he says about Jesus. You will find that indeed Jesus was not just uh, you know, a, a, a history, a, a good story for kids in the first century, but he was indeed a man who was alive and who was... Um, crucified 
and who then came to life. You will probably, if you wanted to read, for example, politicians like Pliny or Tacitus in the first century, these were Roman uh, politicians and they wrote, for example, Tacitus wrote that uh, Jesus was crucified under Pontius Pilate. A fact in history, he indeed notified to the world that Jesus didn't just exist, but that he himself died and under the rule of Pontius Pilate. So nobody in the ancient world ever questioned the existence of Jesus. Everybody believed that he was indeed a historical character. Somebody that came to this world and the way he died was known throughout all the ancient world. I will commend you to read, for example, an, an article by uh, the newspaper The Guardian in the 14th of April 2017. In this article, they talk about Christ and his death as a fact of human history. The Romans' cap capital punishment was in the first century one of the most gruesome and horrendous bloody ways of uh, punishing people, making them public public uh, executions in which they could uh, portray their their power and 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 the you know the authority of their empire and Romans uh, as you will know uh, did these things even for the sake of entertainment I mean everybody knows about the Roman Coliseum right how many people gave their lives uh, being uh, eaten by lions and, and fighting gladiators because the Roman Empire was one that was bloodthirsty. Horrendous things happened throughout uh, this empire and, and they dominated the great majority of the ancient world. Well, um, when a centurion was given the order to execute a prisoner, they would execute that prisoner and they would make sure that that prisoner was dead. You see, the reason why they would do something like that would be because if the prisoner was to escape, the centurion or else jailkeeper or whoever was in charge, the soldier who was in charge of that prisoner was to pay with their own lives. So when Jesus was taken captive as a thief and taken as somebody who had done something wrong and was judged and was then executed these Roman soldiers were not playing with him. They were not sort of trying to, to be gentle and kind with him. They were given an order to execute, to kill, to crucify Jesus. And that's what they did. If you read in the, in the narrative of the New Testament, if, for example, in the book of Matthew, chapter 27, Mark 15, Luke 23, and John 19, you will find the details of how Jesus was executed. There's no question that he was dead at the end of his execution. The Bible says, for example, that they beat him up so severely that he was unrecognizable. It says that he was whipped and they used something that was called a whip of cords. They probably had a metal or bone or stone ends to these uh, whip ends and they will hit somebody on the back until their backs were completely torn apart. The amount of blood that the person would lose by being punished with this cord of whip of cords, sorry, was was terrible. Many many people who were punished in this way would not even survive the judgment. After this he was nailed to a cross through his hands and through his feet. He was wearing a crown of thorns that pierced his skull. And then he was left hanging for hours, unable to breathe. Medically, it is impossible for somebody to survive such punishment. Imagine the state in which the body of Jesus was when he was there hanging on that cross. And then in every breath just trying to pull himself up in order to be able to breathe. He probably died of asphyxiation or of heart failure. 
and then if that was not enough just to make sure that the prisoners would not remain hanging on that cross until the following day soldiers will come and break their legs just to make sure that they will indeed hang and that will suppress their chest so that they would indeed die of asphyxiation but because Jesus had already died at that point the Bible describes as the soldier came with a spear and pierced his side most likely perforating either his lungs and his heart and the Bible describes that he came out of his side water and blood this is something that doctors describe as the effects of a, a hypovolemic shock or a pericardial effusion something happens through that process of hard constant breathing short spaces of breathing through the process of asphyxiation where liquid accumulates around the heart and around the lungs so it is not surprised that when they pierced his side he bled and most probably he drained his heart so there is no doubt there is absolutely no doubt that Jesus being executed by the Romans could have survived that kind of punishment and then it says that they took his body down and they wrapped him in cloths and put him on a tomb because he was near the day of rest now think about that for a minute if somebody could have somehow survived such punishment that in itself would have been a, a greater miracle if you like if somebody could have survived that kind of Roman execution imagine the state in which that person physically would have been put in a place do you think somebody with that strength would have just waken up a day and a half, two days later and then roll a massive stone? With what, with what strength? With what energy? After his body was completely destroyed. It is impossible that Jesus did not die. He did die. And his death, according to the scripture, was to pay for the sins of us human beings but what the scripture then describes is that he then raised on the third day and he rolled the stone or the stone was rolled away now if you want to go and read an article for example by the biblical archaeology society about the way tombs were sealed in those days I recommend you to go and search for it because it wasn't just like a nice pretty round stone that was kind of rolled in this in this cave that he could kind of very easily roll over it was more like like a cork in a in a wine bottle that kind of like a conical shape that was pushed against this uh, cave entry which one man would have been impossible to push out and in the state physically in the state in which he would have been it would have been absolutely impossible for anybody having been punished that severely to be even able to walk the Bible described that when Jesus was taken to the cross he kind of stumbled and fell several times precisely because he had bled so much because his punishment was so severe because the night before he was in the garden of Gethsemane praying practically all night he had not been eating anything he was in fasting for hours and hours and then after the judgment and after hanging on that cross it was impossible for somebody to survive that but whoa what a glorious time it was when he came back to life the Bible describes that after um, the day of rest happened uh, according to John 20 and 21 he appeared again uh, Mary and other women came over trying to do something to kind of uh, finish the process of uh, you know protecting the body and covering him with spices and just kind of the, the, a proper a proper burial for him and when they came over the first day of the week very early in the morning they found that the stone was rolled away and the body was gone and only the clothes were there and it says that even the the cloth that was covering his face was kind of folded and put to the side and they saw visions of angels saying to them that he had raised from the dead
They run to see the disciples. They run to tell them of, of what had happened. And then Peter and, J and John came running to the tomb to see what had happened. And he says, and they saw and believed. But whilst this was happening, the Bible describes that Mary was there kind of questioning who had taken the body of her Lord. And she saw a man there and she thought he was a gardener. So she asked him, to see if he knew who had taken away the body. Now just think about this for a minute. His own disciples, both men and women, were surprised to know what had happened. And, and Mary was asking, who is it that took the body away? In a way, as, as if thinking, how could this possibly be? Unless somebody would have probably come overnight and taken the body away. But it wasn't. You see, the disciples were surprised by this, but this is exactly as we read what the scripture described. It was already prophesied that the Christ would die and resurrect, come back to life on the third day. And then if you continue the reading, for example, on the book of Luke chapter 24, you will see that the very, day, the same, the very same day, uh, later on, he appeared to two men in the way to Emmaus. And then that same evening, he appeared to 11 of his disciples, but Thomas wasn't there with him. Eight days later, he appeared again to the 12 disciples, but now Thomas was already there with them. After that, uh, he appeared again to seven of his disciples at the Sea of T Tiberias, or Tiberias. And then, according to what we read in 1 Corinthians 15, it says he appeared to more than 500 people at once. This was not a vision. This was Jesus, the resurrected Lord, appearing to more than 500 people. All of these people were eyewitnesses of the fact that Jesus was indeed alive. This wasn't like a, a, just, a, just a thing amongst his disciples. This was hundreds of people. And then later he appeared to James, and then he appeared to all the disciples, and Paul himself, the writer of this letter, he's saying, and finally he appeared to me as well, so that I may preach this gospel to all of the Gentiles. So Paul, who was previously a persecutor of the church, he was the one that was now, whose life had been transformed. And now he was the very person who was talking about Jesus. And you know why his life was transformed? Because he saw the resurrected Jesus. The one who he had heard that had been crucified. The one who he heard used to say that he was the son of God who had come to this world to give his life as a ransom for many. He saw the very Jesus before him and he fell on his knees and he said my Lord my Lord he recognized who Jesus was and he gave his life to him and his life was completely transformed so much so that his name was changed from Saul of Tarsus to now Paul the Apostle and now he is the one that is writing to the Corinthians you think how is this possible and he says if it is not possible then our faith is in vain but I am telling you this indeed happened. All of these eyewitnesses are there to testify. Many of them are still alive. Some of them have already passed. But he, he even appeared to me and he gave me the commission to go and proclaim the gospel to the Gentiles. You see, these proofs are undeniable. You can say whatever you want, you can think whatever you want, you can be an, a skeptic, you can, you can say, well, it's relative, you can say, I don't know, but again, are these things true or are they false? Do we choose to believe what is true or do we choose not to believe? That will be a matter for you and I to ask ourselves. And now we come to the end of this message. A place where I would like to challenge you to do your homework. A place where I would invite you to go and do your own research, go and check in the pages of history, go and find out everything that is written. Go and ask 
these kind of questions to doctors and people who know about whether or not it is possible for somebody in the condition where Jesus was to be still alive after such punishment. It is your responsibility to go and look for answers. But let me tell you something, like many people have tried in the past, you will come to a conclusion. The question is, is enough evidence enough evidence? You might ask, well, how does this affect me personally? What, what is, how did knowing this can make any difference in my life? Well, the answer is very simple. It's very, very, very simple. If Jesus came back from the dead, then that proves that he indeed is who he said he was. Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. He, came, he claimed to be Emmanuel, the very God, the creator of heaven and earth here on earth. He performed many miracles, he walked on water, he healed many people, he even resurrected people when he was alive, Lazarus and, and others. And the scripture describes that he has the power, he had the power to give his life and he had the power to bring himself back from the dead, to take his life again, because he is the one who possesses the power over life and death. If Jesus indeed came back from the dead, then everything that he said, every single word of what he taught, is not just good suggestions for humanity, it's not just some sort of philosophy or ideology that somebody can just kind of try whether or not to think about them and, and, and maybe consider. If Jesus indeed came back from the dead, then there is a second life. We have a hope for eternity. That means that he indeed paid for our sins. And that means that we are indeed able to be forgiven for our sins. That, that means that there is life after this one. There is an eternity. And that also means that if he died, we can be forgiven so that we can experience life eternally with Him. Let's just take a minute and think about these things as we consider uh, these claims that the Bible itself tells us about the resurrection of Christ and consider whether or not you would like your life to have meaning, to know the reason for your existence. Everybody is looking for hope, for eternity, and it is only through Christ that we can have that. Let's pray. Father, what a glorious and wonderful victory Christ had over death. What a precious hope. What a terrible punishment he had to suffer. But what a glorious way to conquer and receive victory. Father, we know that in him we have hope for eternal life, for redemption, for salvation, for forgiveness for our sins. Lord, we're grateful because you were willing to come to this world to give you life as a ransom for many so that through faith we might access your forgiveness through believing in your sacrifice we will be made one with you so that our debt would be cancelled it will be paid for so that we could experience life in this world and forevermore Lord, we're grateful. Thank you for what you've done for us. Thank you because indeed, indeed in you we have hope. In you we have life. In you we have freedom. In you we have redemption. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name.
Hello everyone and thank you again for joining us at Disciples Church Online. We hope that the sermon blessed you. Um, after our service, like I mentioned before, we are going to have a communion service as well. So for members of the church, as I previously mentioned, if you follow the third link, that's number three on WhatsApp or email, it will take you through to our communion page in which we can share in that together. Also, my pastor Vlad has asked me to share with you as well. Over the next four Sundays, we are going to be doing a special study after church service from 1 p.m. till 2.30 is specifically on the resurrection of Christ. The Sundays are going to be Sunday the 19th of April, Sunday the 26th of April, Sunday the 3rd of May and Sunday the 10th of May. And these are going to be from 1 p.m. till 2.30. We're going to look at the resurrection of Christ from a historical, legal, rational, philosophical and theological point of view from every area in detail together. If you're a member of the church and we have your contact details, we can automatically send you a link to that meeting. If you're not a member and you would like to take part in those studies, please do get in contact with us. Um, drop us your contact details. We won't spam you and send you email after email. It will simply be with the purpose of helping you join on to our studies about the resurrection of Christ over the next following four Sundays. As always, God bless, and we hope to see you again next Sunday here at Disciples Church Online at 10.30. Stay safe.